Well, yes, I had two hot dogs. <laughs> you know, you can't get a good hot dog in Columbia, South Carolina. You also can't get good pizza. It is, yeah, it's really unfortunate. So um, hopefully one day the National Resource Center will move and I can come back and be by you guys. Um, so I got a lot to talk about today, probably way too much, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, and you, but you can ask me questions at any point in time or tell me to slow down or shut up or calm down, whatever happens, OK? Um, but we, I, I'm excited. This is a really exciting opportunity to be here um, because my job is um, at the University of South Carolina as part of the National Resource Center and um, University 101 programs is faculty development and assessment for our course. So my job is to do uh, take the assessment that we, we do for our course and drive our faculty development efforts. And it's really fun to be here today because I get to talk to you about some of those best practices because the, the things we do there, we take to the national stage, we take from the national stage and bring it back to us, um, and we tell a good story about you know, what we need to do and why we need to do it to uh, rock the first year experience. Um, but what's exciting, and Tom told me, I, I could be, it's going to be a fun day because all you are excited, you're, you're happy to be here. Does that sound about right? Is anybody mad? <laughs> Nobody's mad? Awesome. Good. So I told, <laughs> oh boy, I have a weird and quirky sense of humor, so just bear with me, all right? So um, I told Kelly not to, she was like, what should I talk about you and blah, 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 blah. And I, I don't think I'm that big of a deal, so um, I was like, just don't say anything. Um, I'll just, <laughs> I'll figure it out. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little story. I figured I'd start the day by telling you a little story about um, how, why in the heck Denise thinks I'm qualified to talk to you today. And I'm not really sure, but what the heck. Um, but it all, it all kind of begins um, in Crystal Lake, Illinois. So I, that's where I grew up. And um, this is the beach house on Crystal Lake. Has anybody ever been there? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah! Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. So for my formative years, um, I worked at, the, at Crystal Lake as a lifeguard, as a swim instructor, and as a lifeguard instructor. And really, that is what gave me my foundation in experiential learning. Um, there is no better way to learn than when you're, you're trying to learn to swim and you're trying not to drown. So quite literally, um, you have to learn to be successful. Um, but we got to do fun activities, engaging pedagogies, um, to get the students excited about getting into the water on a cold day um, and pushing themselves harder than they thought they could to achieve something that they know they want to achieve, but they don't know exactly what it looks like. So from there, I went to college at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, which is a fantastic place if you haven't been. Um, they also have the color red, and so I'm feeling very at home right now. Um, but at the University of Wisconsin, as I be, you know, um, officially uh, was born as Denise's um, orientation grandson, um, is that too weird? <laughs> <laughs> too weird. Uh, some jokes just aren't good after a while. But um, so. But there, I, I got involved with um, residential life, and uh, I got involved with an, the orientation team, um, and I was eventually uh, got my first experience teaching a first-year seminar. And what was cool about the first-year seminar is it was, uh, it was, at the time, was just getting kicked off, and a lot of the students in the classes were um, athletes. And so I had these athletes, and you know, had football players, and Wisconsin's okay at football, you may have heard. Um, and you know, so these guys are top-tier athletes who are being recruited from across the country. And what surprised me most was that if we held them to those high expectations and we gave them great things to talk about, we were we had some one of some of the most fantastic conversations I've ever had about social justice and diversity. Um, and it's really pretty awesome as to what first-year students can do. Um, if you hold them to those high expectations and then you give them the opportunity to excel um, and having those good conversations in those small groups is what really got me inspired to want to continue to do this. So I went down to Appalachian State University, um, Boone, North Carolina. Has anybody ever been there? A couple people. It's a beautiful place, right? Yeah, it's very nice. Um, special little place in the mountains. Their claim to fame is that they beat Michigan in football in 2007 um, and we're still talking about it. So. Uh, <laughs> They're going to officially no longer be good at football because they decided to go um, to Division 1A. So we'll see what happens. But they had a good run. Anyway, beautiful place. And up there, it's a, you know, it's a little bit of hippy-dippy, but that's OK. Um, and I got involved in outdoor education, um, in experiential education. I was doing leadership development in and outdoors. And it's amazing what 
you can do when you're getting students up and engaged with each other and you're giving them opportunities to reflect. And that's where I was really learned the most about silence. Uh, my supervisor used to say, we'd sit in a circle and say, Kevin, this is where the magic happens. You know, so as the students, their voices are coming across that middle, um, they're learning from each other. They're developing their own learning. And that's something I, I, I learned there. And um, through an act of faith, um, I moved down to Columbia, South Carolina. That's our historic horseshoe. Um, fun fact, a few of the only buildings in the South that existed um, pre-Civil War. So Sherman didn't burn these. Go us. Um, and you know, there I've had the great opportunity to continue to work with faculty um, to improve the course and do some really cool things. And so that's why I'm here today, and I'm super psyched about it. Um, I hope you are too. Um, you know, you're a good old Illinois guy, right? So the thing that we learned, though, is through these positions that I held, there was an immense amount of training. Does any of you work with student leaders? You do a lot of training for student leaders? We see, OK, a lot of training. It's intensive. How much training do most faculty members get in teaching? Zero. Very little. It's a fa fascinating thing about higher education that we don't talk about pedagogy in PhD programs. Um, and it's disappointing uh, because it really makes a huge difference. For all the things we've learned, if I were to ask you which experiences you've had that you learned the most, the most meaningful learning experiences, I do this with people all the time, they tell me about things where they, you know, they had a mentor, or someone gave them a problem to solve, or they, had, they failed and then they had to succeed, or maybe they got to develop a project all on their own. They did something. They don't tell me about how they sat there and listened to someone, even though I'm talking at you right now. <laughs> what a jerk. Uh, <laughs> Tom also made fun of me for wearing a tie. Um, he said, you know, you're separating yourself from your students. And I said, you know, I know I never wear a tie, like ever. Um, but I decided to today, so just don't do what I'm doing, you know, do what I'm telling you to do. <laughs> Sorry. But let me tell you, let's talk about what faculty development is. And um, I put up a couple of quotes up here. The thing I just want to focus on here is that the goal is to improve student learning. So it's not to say anybody's not good at teaching or it's some sort of punitive nature. It's to improve student learning, which is everybody's goal anyway. Uh, so we want to just do it the best way possible. I'll tell you a short story. There was this boy named Joe, Joe I'm making it up. Um, his name was Joe. He had a buddy named Jim. All right. They were out walking the dog. And Joe says to Jim, you know, I taught my dog. I taught him to whistle. And uh, I don't, I've already scripted the names. Um, so anyway, Joe says, well, he's not whistling. He said, oh, I know. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned. <laughs> so there's a big difference between teaching and learning. Um, as we all know, we, there's a lot of things we'd like to teach, but that's not necessarily how we learn. But what's cool about um, faculty development is that it can have some fantastic impacts on the campus at large. So the University of South Carolina, when we started the first year seminar in 1972, so when I say we, I'm clearly lying. Um, I wasn't there. Uh, but they, when they started it in 1972, they, they created it in response to student riots on campus. Students were angry, and they weren't sure why. They didn't come to the University of South Carolina angry, but they became angry while they were there. So this initiative was not to inculcate first-year students. It was to improve faculty teaching on campus, because that was considered to be the thing that made the big impact on the student experience at the time. So it, the first-year seminar didn't develop just as a first-year seminar. It developed in tandem with a faculty development initiative um, called the Teaching Experience Workshop, which we are still doing to this day. I flew in yesterday as soon as we finished one. Um, so faculty development has impacts on the campus at large, and that's why this program was started, is because we were trying to improve teaching and learning. But I wanted to show you just some numbers from our instructors, and it's, I think you probably see similar numbers, you feel similar ways. But when we um, survey instructors, they said, as a result of Teaching University 101, um, that they had a better understanding of students, they learned things they could apply to their other professional responsibilities, they're more satisfied with the University of South Carolina, they feel more committed to the University of South Carolina, um, they've improved their teaching in their other courses, and all of them, 100%, said they enjoyed the experience. And what's cool about this is this is about a 75% response rate on a sample size of about 200 instructors. So it's, it's pretty legit. 
you know, these people enjoy their experience. My supervisor, Dan Friedman, wrote his dissertation on the positive impacts on the experience of faculty, staff, administrators, whoever's teaching the first year seminar, and they reported these things consistently at across institutions and across time, that teaching the first year seminar engages people in their campus community in a more meaningful way, they understand students better, and they improve their teaching in other courses. Booyah. <laughs> so another kind of component is this one, is that we're, we're trying to increase our competence and effectiveness in meeting learner needs, instructor needs, and the needs of the institution. So Grosha and Hunter wrote a book, and I'm going to cite it a lot today because Hunter is Stuart Hunter and she's my boss, so I, I have to you know, give her homage. But she wrote a great book, um, and the goal is three, threefold when we're talking about faculty development. You all are here today to de develop as individuals, hopefully develop as instructors, but certainly to give back to the Northern Illinois community to, to enhance the student experience at, the, at, at Northern Illinois University. I almost said the University of Northern Illinois. You would have been upset, right? Uh, see? Um, so that's, that's, our, that's our primary objective. So we got these three goals here, because um, what we're trying to do is improve everything. This isn't just a, you know, we're going to have one great class. We're going to have a fantastic student experience at Northern Illinois. Everybody feels okay about that? Anybody mad? No? All right. Just tell me when you get mad. Oh, all right. So that's that. Let me show you something. You know what that is? It's a compass. All right. Good work. We're passing tests today. That's assessment. Direct assessment. Okay, what I want you to do, I'm going to ask you to do something here using nothing but your intuition, so you can't use your phone. I want you to stand up and face north. <laughs> yeah, that, that is definitely wrong. All right, since most people are over here, so okay, lock in where you're standing. So tell me, you know, why or how you decided to stand the direction you're standing. Sir? Okay. So he's trying to use trying to use a previous reference point, you know, the sun. It's a good reference point, yes? I was looking at the campus map this morning before I came here to find the building is. <laughs> okay. So you had a tool this morning, it happened to be the campus map, and so you kinda of remember where that was going. So reference point of the past. Okay, yeah, all right. So everybody else is facing this way, so I'm facing that way, all right? I know the west end of campus is that way. Okay, another reference point, wonderful. Okay, did anybody just stand up and say, I don't care, whatever? <laughs> all right, there it is, thank you. Okay, you can sit back down. Let me, let me posit something for you. So when first year students come to college, we, like I just asked you to do, instead of standing, say stand up and face north, we say stand up and be successful. Good luck. They try three things. They use, a, they use tools from that they learned in high school and try to apply them to college. That doesn't work. No? They got hammers and they're trying to you do a Phillips head screwdriver type, type thing. It's just not working out. Or they're making a big mess. The next part is maybe they're, uh, they, uh, they're just going to do what everybody else is doing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, these people seem smart. I'm going to follow them. Yeah, my roommate's cool. I'm just going to do what, what he's doing. He's watching. TV all day and playing video games, but whatevs. You know, he seems happy. And then the last option, the last thing folks do is they just say, whatever, I'll just figure it out. Um, they use the, uh, as we were talking about the millennial generation, there's a lot of video games. You're playing a video game, you go the wrong way, you blow up, you die, what happens? You start over, duh. And now you're not going to go back that way because you know you're going to blow up and die. So, but unfortunately, as um, you know, Anne alluded to with financial aid, you don't get a reset button on your GPA, on your college experience. So you, that trial and error, while the greatest way to learn, is probably not the most effective because of the, all the setbacks that you're going to experience. Now, I tell you that for two reasons. One, I think it's important to give us some context on first year students, but also because it's the same thing for first year seminar instructors at most institutions in this country. Teach the first year seminar, good luck. Um, and they try three different things as well, the same kind of concepts, using tools from other courses like lecture, boring sauce. And um, then they, they, they do what everybody else is doing, so they try to guess based on what their first year seminar may have been like. Believe it or not, first year seminars are different at every institution. And then the last part is they just guess. And it's not fair to our students to just guess. 
Just go out there and give it a try, trial by fire, see what happens. Because, you know, if it doesn't work, yay, you're fine. You still got paid, but they didn't have a great experience, right? So that's not really what we're trying to do here. So faculty development, if nothing else, if nothing else provides the compass for which we can move forward with our work. Sound good? Yeah? I like that? You like that little metaphor? Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you about what I do and my bias today, because like I said, other, we, you know, we all do this differently. So I work with University 101 at the University of South Carolina. About 80% of our students voluntarily enroll in the course. We've been around for 41 years, so that's, that's just nice. We've capped sections at 19 because the provost said so. Um, why do you think he said 19, or she? No, he. Why did he say 19? It switched. You think it's because you know, we're really student-centered? Anybody follow US News and World Report rankings? You're ranked by if you have classes that are lower than 19, 19 or less. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's it. Um, so, but that's what we want to. But I would go to 18 if I had my way. Um, but we're a three credit letter graded course. Um, it's taught by faculty, staff, and administrators from across campus, representing about 80 different departments, probably like you all, representing lots of different places across campus. Um, and 95% uh, of our sections have a peer or graduate co-instructor. And we're an extended orientation course, much like yours, with three broad goals to foster academic success, help students discover and connect with the University of South Carolina, um, and prepare our students to live, lead responsible lives in a diverse, interconnected, and changing world. Yeah, that sounds not terrible. Um, and we do an okay job at it. But I want to show you what I do full time is I coordinate this bad boy, the faculty development plan at the University of South Carolina. And um, you know you do have to give credit um, to Denise and Kelly for the work that they're doing here, because they're giving you a great experience. And uh, we've, we, this model is relatively new. It actually didn't go into effect until about 2008, 2009 fully. Um, we all, like I said, it all started with the Teaching Experience Workshop, a three-day uh, intensive training for new instructors, which I heard some of you went through yesterday. How many of you went through it yesterday? Hey, hey welcome, day two. All right. And then we do some uh, syllabus training preparation. We do a conference next week if anybody wants to come up. Um, I do a summer workshop. I don't personally, but there's one every day of the summer. Uh, we do meetings in the fall. And then we give them a big faculty resource manual like the one uh, you all get. And we got some things on the internet. And we hang out and talk about University 101. I'm not going to go into depth because it doesn't really matter what we do. I just wanted to show you what we do. And I wanted to show you the results of what we do. That faculty development model, like I said, went into effect fully in fall 2009. Okay, So here we are, fall 2009. Here we are, fall 2012 just happened. And you can see um, significant improvement in these four key demographic questions. The, the one here that they would recommend their instructor. The, um, the second one, the blue line here, is that they would recommend future students take the course. The uh, purple line here is that they, they found it to be a valuable experience. And the green line is it helped their adjustment to college life. Now this has improved, as you can see, every single year since the um, implementation of the faculty development model. It was kind of stagnant, as you could imagine, prior to that. Um, and so this stuff works. It really, really works. Because you all go back and you teach kick butt, I almost said the bad word, kick butt courses. Um, and you give your students a fantastic experience and they absolutely love you. And that's what means something in this class. So now this is neat. And why this is also neat is because it's not just like, Kevin, did you skew the data? No, actually, I like, made it terribly harder for our, us by adding a ton more students and a ton more sections. So over the, so I said 2009, right? At 2009, this was the worst part of the financial crisis, as you recall. We had to cut um, sections. And um, we had a lot more students in a section. Um, and then every year since then, the University of South Carolina has been increasing in size because we, you know, we got to pay our bills. Um, so we've been increasing in size, and we've been increasing the number of sections. This is when the provost said they have to be kept at 19, so we went up by a, a lot. And now we're here with a huge cohort in fall 2013. But what this, what this demonstrates is that with more students and more instructors, so more instructors who are going through the faculty development process may have never taught before, may, not, may have not, never taught at the University of South Carolina at least, um, are going through a faculty development model that's leading to these kind of results. So these are similar things that I'm expecting to see here at Northern Illinois. You already have fantastic course evaluations, but it's going to keep getting better because y'all are awesome. And you know why you're awesome? Because you're doing this. 
you're teaching a first year seminar and it means a lot to the students and to the success of this institution. And this class is not successful. It is successful for no other reason than you. Period. The University of South Carolina, the first year seminar is not good because I work there. Well, maybe. <laughs> I'm kidding, that's not true. <laughs> um, it is good because the individuals, instructors in the course care deeply about the work that they're doing. Um, and they come to our events and they train and get better because this course is only as good as the individual instructor and the course overall is only as good as the faculty. So that's you guys. So congratulations. Way to be awesome. Nice job. So since you're so awesome, I'll probably just stop talking today. Um, but I want to get myself caught up in my notes. So what's interesting is they, this, this, these folks in the 80s, this guy named Skiff, he was, uh, he was looking at a feedback model with um, uh, physicians is really what was happening. But they, what they did is they, they gave half the group intensive feedback. And it's the kind of stuff you all do, where somebody sits in your class and gives you feedback, right? Tom, you do that? Yeah, they give you feedback. And they did this for about 50% of the group. And what they found is that one in six instructors improved dramatically because they were getting this feedback. And then for the group that wasn't getting it, it was only one in 16 were improving. So that's 6% if you're wondering. Um, did, did I just say that wrong? Yeah, I did, because I meant 40%, and that's not one in six. Too many numbers. Um, so 40% improved, and then one in 16 improved without any intervention. And so what they found, and they had pr two primary, hello, Siri, she's confused. Is anyone else confused? <laughs> <laughs> so this, this was quoted in, in Grosch and Hunter's book, but Skeff found that there were two primary takeaways, is that teaching will not improve on its own, and it may deteriorate without intervention. So this is an important thing to know. So I wanted to kind of run through what I think are maybe the 10 things that faculty development provides. And this might not be mind boggling, so I'll go kind of quick. But first, of course, is skill development and pedagogical improvement. And pedagogy means teaching and good pedagogy, engaging pedagogy is our goal. So getting people like psyched up and having a good old time. So we want to do some good stuff and we want to develop our skills. So that's obviously the first one. The second um, is we want to share best practices for achieving learning outcomes. So those of you in the room, you all are your best teachers because somebody figured it out. What's your name, sir? Leonard. Leonard? Yeah. Leonard knows how to teach time management. Right, Leonard? Yeah. yeah. And he does it so much better than Stephen, but Stephen kicks butt and talking about wellness, right, Stephen? That's right. Yeah. Was that a good guess? <laughs> um, so they're going to help each other, and they're both going to improve. The, guaranteed. So I am not an expert on anything, quite ex at all. Um, but the nice thing about my job is to go find people that are doing good things and bring them together. Because that's where the experts lie, that we create the knowledge together just like we want to do in our first year seminars. right? Third is sharing innovations and new approaches. Um, as our students change, the way we teach this course changes. As our students change, higher education changes. So as um, Ann was talking about before, if all, of our, if all of higher education, if the whole point is knowledge acquisition, we're out of business. Google does it way better than us, like 8,000 times better than us. So our job is to help students to teach to, excuse me, to think, um, to, be, to, to, to take in all this information and synthesize it, to move up Bloom's taxonomy. Um, that's our job. And so we're going to figure out how we're going to respond to their needs in a meaningful way. Networking and relationship building. I hope you guys like each other. Does anybody not like anyone? No? Why don't you give every, the person next to you a high five? You know what? Why don't, why don't you do it one more time and this time say, good job. Because <laughs> if you're not having fun, what the heck's the point, right? So yes, you should enjoy each other today, get to know each other, um, hang out, be BFFs, <laughs> Biffles, which is best friends for life. I get confused with that. Um, and then norming and consistency between sections. You all want to be on the same page. 
because it's, you know, it's not good if, Rachel? Yeah. All right, what's your name? Angela. So Angela is giving out like 20 page research papers and Rachel's giving out candy and leaving nice. early. And then, so then what happens is it's like, oh, this class is so hard. And then it's like, this class is the best ever. I don't do anything. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the A for the high five. Like, see, now, now it's not cool anymore. Now people are mad, right? Now you guys aren't friends because Rachel's too easy. So um, that was, <laughs> can, you, can you take that off the record? <laughs> I just lost my job. <laughs> so, all right. There it is. Um, Rachel's class is too easy. Uh, oh. So I heard you have a new, um, you're going to have a new common reading experience this fall. That's exciting. You're going to find out about that later. I already know. I won't tell you. Don't worry. Um, I also heard you have a great faculty resource manual. And I know it's great because I wrote a lot of it. So. Um, but I hear Tom wrote a lot of it too, right? I just cut up your work. Good. Good job. It's mostly chaos, and I stole it from other people, like I told you before. But if you want to share those exciting new opportunities. What's going on? What's happening? What do we know? What does MapWorks teach us? Um, you know, it's a great tool. MapWorks is a fantastic tool, but like all assessment tools, if you don't use it, it's useless. So what do we know? How are we going to use it, right? Yeah, you're welcome. I'm helping you out. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So we want to do that. We want to talk about our problems. We talk about our challenges and how we're going to solve them. We've got to understand first your students, um, what they need, they want, and their emerging trends in, that, in the field. And luckily, uh, we got a little bit of an overview. But some of it's going to be get, it's on the ground, folks. We can look at data all day. I spent Wednesday with John Pryor. He's the director of the Cooperative Institutional Research Program at UCLA. So they've been studying first year students for 50 years. Is that about right? Uh, 50 years. And so, you know, great, fantastic data, really interesting stuff, cool things I learned. Um, you know, let's, they all go to college, and what do you think they want? Yeah, they want a job. That's like the top five things they want. A job, money, stability, um, that's what they want. When they graduate, it's different, it changes. You know what it is? Senior survey? Work-life balance. Fun fact. All right. So if our students are coming in wanting money, um, and that's all they care about, and then they leave wanting work-life balance, it's a bad thing to talk about it on an interview. Um, you know, hey, I'd like to work for you, but not more than 40 hours a week. <laughs> <clears throat> so we want to know where they're at so we can understand them, we can talk about them, where they're going. Um, and then we want to help get connected to those new resources I mentioned before, and then have the opportunity for personal reflection and self-evaluation. So Kelly, good old Badger, is talking about your end-of-course evaluation results. Right? That's what you. Right. Yeah. Everybody got them. Everybody read them. Huh? Everybody gonna apply them? Yeah. yeah? Good. Good for you. Awesome. I like you guys. Uh, but you want to use that data for improvement, and sometimes it's sharing it with other people that makes a big difference. Where are we at on time here? I'm getting close to the end. Too close. I got a lot more to talk about. There's like 80 pages here. So faculty development um, is also ongoing. It's something you can continue to do. So. Um, I would encourage you, if you're not doing these four things, to get engaged in these four things on your own. One is um, creating your own little learning communities of awesome teachers who want to hang out and share good ideas. Do it. Um, the next is to attend the first year uh, experience conference, if you want. We're going to be in San Diego next year. That'll be fun. But there's a lot of conferences on teaching and learning. There's a lot of conferences on the first year experience. And I'd encourage you, if, you're, if you got the opportunity to go, to attend some of those things. I'd also encourage you to present, publish, and uh, talk about the things that you're doing and the things that are working. You'll learn a lot more about yourself, um, but you'll also be able to apply it. We have this thing called eSource for College Transitions, which is basically a nice little handbook on innovative practices in the first year. So write for that. And then um, keep coming to stuff like this. I like you guys. So I already told you that you are each other's best, um, you are each other's best educators. Don't try, do trial by fire. Talk to other people about what you should do. Enlist the help of campus experts. We've got Student Success Center people in here. That's not what it's called. It is what it's called? Uh, thank you. Uh, we got people that know good things around here. So utilize them, because sometimes you just don't know what kind of resources you can point your students to until you get to know the people around this room, the people who can tell you what to do, where to go, where to find those things. Um, and here's the last two. The last two are going to guide what we're going to talk about for the rest of the day. The last two things are excellent teaching leads to fantastic outcomes for students. And I didn't just make that up. There's research to back that up, which I'll share a little bit of today. But that's 
this, your good teaching will make profound impacts on the success of your students. And that's why we do this work. That's why first year seminars work uh, as a tool. And then the last thing here is we want to focus on the things that matter the most and make the largest impact. So you all got your course evaluations back. I didn't look at them. Um, although then I know the aggregate data is very good. But we do an assessment where we find out what people are doing well, what they're not doing well. And one of them is that you have taught your students about um, how to use a computer. It's one of the questions. Do you think using a computer is a learning outcome of University 101? No, it's not. I don't have computers in seminar classrooms. There's no room for that. So everyone does bad on that score because they didn't teach their students how to use a computer. And people are like, oh my god, I did bad on that. I'm like, dude, I didn't, you're not supposed to talk about that. It's fine. It's a survey that somebody else has put together. We just happen to use. But if fo people focus on the little thing that doesn't matter, which they do, we're wasting our time and energy. We want to focus on the things that do matter. And I'm going to show you what some of those things are today. So those are our two things. We're going to focus on why good teaching improves the student experience, and we're going to focus on what matters most. Sound good? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Awesome. All right. Here's what we know, though, folks. Persistence. 40% of college students will leave higher education without getting a degree. The percent of national percentage of people the age, the age what, 20 to 60, 20 to 80, who have a college degree is approximately 31%. One in three people in the United States has a college degree, even though these students think everyone has a college degree. And they, because you know, if you look, you ask them, 85% of them are going to get at least a master's. If you ask first year students. Um, but that's not reality. We know that's not reality. This number hasn't changed much. That's a 1990 number. 20 years later, it's still about the same thing. 75% of students leave within their first year um, or two of college. Um, so we know that this first semester matters. Jillian Kinsey at a conference in uh, February um, said, the first year is too important to be left to chance. And that, my friends, it is. It is far too important to be left to chance. So we don't have to leave it to chance. We're kicking butt. We teach a first year seminar. But here's the other thing. The decision to leave often leaves students in a position to earn much less over a lifetime of work. I'm going to explain that in a hot second through, a, through an activity, but just hold on to that. Um, but the next thing here is during that first year is when they're making the greatest amount of gains in terms of their development. We have such a fantastic opportunity. As Anne said, over the summer, nothing magical happens. They're by themselves hanging out. Maybe they got a job. But for the most part, that development is kind of stagnant. But they come in the first semester, and they're challenged in a meaningful way. It's like through the roof. So we have a fantastic opportunity in that first semester to do that. But we must engage our students in that experience. So as the college experience is only as good as what students put into it, because um, then they will get out of it returns that are just unbelievably fantastic. But like your colleagues and you, maybe, how many times you go to optional things? You go. You're good. All right. But I don't. I mean, come on. It's optional. Whatever. I don't have to go. Students don't do optional, period, at all, especially first year students. Well, OK. 10% of, 10 of them do. There's that special gold group that goes to everything because they have to. That's a true colors reference. Um, but yeah, for the most part, students don't do optional. So we need to engage them in, we need to, no, excuse me, we need to meaningfully engage them in their first year by requiring them to do some things that are good for them. So George Koo would have all of us make first year student, make for every first year student do MapWorks and every first year student take the first year seminar. Unfortunately, that's not a reality for most of us. But at the same time, we recognize that we can engage them in meaningful things and we know what works and what doesn't work. So let me show you something. This is um, iPads data from the uh, National Center for Education Statistics. I just want to give you a sense of where we're at with um, NIU. So 71% of students are returning from their first year to their second year, with only 56% who started in that first year, the same cohort. Um, well, excuse me, not this isn't the same cohort, but the, uh, from their first year are graduating. Well, 56% are graduating from this institution in six years. Now, it may, they may graduate later. They may graduate from other institutions. But it's something to be aware of. So I, I asked Denise, who's a peer institution in UIC, um, Illinois at Chicago. Uh, it's about the same. Um, but when you look at institutions, an aspirational one, Illinois State University is getting about 85%, 71% um, graduation rate. And just to show you my institution, we're about here too. So um, we all got a lot of work to do in figuring out how we're going to help our students persist through college. It's a, 
it's a national epidemic of sorts, um, a lack of college completion. So we have an incredible responsibility to influence that. So, and why? I guess the question is why does it matter? And that's why I want to play the family feud. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. Um, Y'all are, what's your family name? Oh, Victor, you can be Team Victor. And then you guys are Team Husky. You, you like that? Victor E. Husky, I figured it out. All right, so are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so here's what's gonna, now we're not gonna, I'm not gonna make people stand up because it's, it's Friday. Um, but what's gonna happen here is we're going to play the family feud. Have y'all played the family feud? So what's a really important thing, and everyone needs to participate in this, is if you know, somebody says something, you gotta say good answer. So let's practice, is ready? Good answer, good answer, nice. Good answer, good, 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 good. So the, the college board um, put together, they found out the benefits, the top, they've had 10, but I narrowed it to seven, top seven benefits of college. And um, I'm gonna, we're gonna try to figure out what those are. So how this works is um, you're, you're, you guys are gonna get the first answer, you get the first guess. We'll see if it's up there. If it's wrong, you get a buzz. That's rough. And then it's your chance. If there's three strikes, it comes to this team, okay? And you have the chance to steal, all right? Here, here it is. So, you ready? Okay, here it comes. Don't, are you not excited? What do you think? What's up there? Better job. Better job. Okay, you know what's unfortunate? I didn't, I just made this. I don't even know where it is. Um, it should be. Good yeah, good answer. Nope, that's not it. No, this is so wrong. Better health. There, uh, higher job satisfaction. Better health is one. What's next? Yeah, it's, yeah. More money. Oh, more money. money. There it is. Number one answer. Good answer. Good answer. All right, sir, what do you think it is? Oh, more friends. It's not up there. But I, you know what? That's nice. That's, that is nice. Uh, I would say maybe they learn something. They do learn something, but unfortunately, yeah, good answer. Good answer. Uh, but the college board says no. <laughs> yeah, college is useless. Didn't you read Academic Through Drift? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Better relationships. Well, here, I'll give you this one. I'm going to be nice. Um, the benefits to kids, their kids are going to uh, have a lot of success um, academically. Good work. Oh, we're going back? No, we're going back around. Coming back. Oh, yeah, let's go to the next row. You guys are in the same family. It's extended. What's your name in the polo shirt there, sir? Brian, what do you think? Let's throw something up there. Opportunity. Let's see what happens if I hit this. Nope. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> bah. <laughs> All right. This game is falling apart. Um, my bad. You guys win. I didn't have any prizes. I know. I'm sorry. All right. I'm running out of time. <laughs> this is an engaging strategy that if you practice better, it can be more fun. But I literally added it 10 seconds before you came in the room. Yes. It's benefit to society. They pay more taxes. We're all better off. That's the, that's the idea. Yes. This is the college board. But the college board says that as a country, that we, the, the top 10 benefits of um, having students who earn degrees is, you know, individuals are earning more money. They have a, they're better protected against things like recessions. Um, they're happier in their jobs. They're healthier. They have, um, is there a weird noise happening? Um, exercise, they're, you know, they're better exercised. Um, they, they get more engaged in their community. They pay more taxes. There's lower social costs on everybody else. That's why they're together. And then they have benefits to their children um, for many years to come. So the college degree matters a lot. It matters a lot. And we know that the greatest chance of a student falling away from that is going to happen in their first year. In their first semester, you all have the greatest influence on that. So John Pryor was talking to us about you know, students. Um, we, we, retention is a crazy beast. It's, it's a hard thing to nail down. But we know the greatest predictors, if a student's at their first choice institution, they probably are going to stay. If they're committed to staying there and their peers are committed to staying there, so if people aren't talking about transferring, there's less of an 
interest in transferring. So if everybody's feeling pretty good about where they're at, they're going to stay. But the third and then probably the most influential is the experience that they had. And the experience that they had can overcome whether or not they're at their first choice institution, whether or not they ever thought about transferring. It can't overcome if everybody else is thinking about transferring. So that's a cultural thing. You know, you want to try to get people on board with sticking around. But the experience that they have um, is the thing that we can influence the most. Um, and, and I'm fairly confident you can do a pretty darn good job of that. So what I want to talk about is just that Annie was talking up here about how ACT scores are not a predictor. They're totally a predictor. Um, sorry, Annie. Um, it, it, when it comes to national data sets, students' high school GPA, students' ACT, SAT scores are great predictors of retention. Okay? They just are. Um, now, let me, let me show you something. So when we talk about Harvard, it's real nice that at Harvard they have a retention rate of like 97% and a graduation rate of like 96%. That's because their inputs are insane. They have the most motivated students in the world um, and they also have a very small cohort and fantastic opportunities. No one ever talks about transferring from Harvard um, and they give them a pretty good undergraduate experience. But the environment is what really matters and oftentimes we're not looking at everything when we're telling stories. But the environment is what really matters, and this is what I want to show you. The University of South Carolina, when we talk about the, the red line here is students who did not take University 101. Uh, so that's about 20% of the student body. And then the blue line here is students who did, did take University 101. Students who did not take University 101 are earning, had lower high school GPAs. They had lower SAT total scores. They had lower predicted GPAs. So like I said before, the most likely, when we look at numbers, when we look at um, our expectations, these students are expected to not do as well. They're expected to be less engaged, potentially, not graduate at the same rate. But, so that's, that's our input. Our environment is an incredibly meaningful first year seminar. And then what happens is, when they finish, the students who aren't expected to do so well get a, signif a statistically significant higher first year GPA. They retain from their first year to their second year at a statistically si significantly higher rate. Um, I'm going to tell you how I fixed that in a second. And then they, they graduate, not I, we. Um, and then they graduate at a statistically significantly higher rate um, than their peers as well. And so this is what Ann was talking about is that yeah, numbers tell you something, but we can make an incredible impact on those numbers by the individual relationship we have with these students. This is what MapWorks is all about. This is what the first year seminar is all about, is we get to overcome what ch trends and charts say because we're giving students an experience that they're looking for. They're having an experience at Northern Illinois, that's the University of South Carolina, that's keeping them there. But here's the most important thing, folks. When we break out our students by quintile, we find that um, these most successful, high-achieving students, we don't have as much of an impact on them, um, mostly because they don't take our class either, because they're honor students and they tell them not to, which is stupid. Um, <laughs> but anywho, um, as you go down to the lowest predicted GPA, so these are the group, the students that we're expecting to do the worst at the University of South Carolina, we are talking about about a 15 percentage uh, swing in their five-year um, graduation rates. This is what this chart is, is five-year graduation rates. Um, and you can see the statistical significance here. So this course makes the biggest impact, and this has been demonstrated by lots of different folks. Um, the, the NESI, the National Survey of Student Engagement, shows the same thing, is that these kind of impacts have the greatest impact on the students that, um, excuse me, interventions have the greatest impact on students who are least likely to succeed. They make a huge impact. And so we're doing fantastic work. So there's the two things. There's the, the question we want to answer here is why do students leave? And this is, this is information from your faculty manual. They're having trouble adjusting. They have uncertain goals. They don't think it's worth staying. They don't feel like they fit. They feel a sense of isolation. There's two primary things happening here. A lack of social integration and a lack of academic integration. Those are the two greatest predictors of a student not feeling like they belong at an institution. Can they, can they make it? Can they get to degree? And do they like the people there? All right? 
So we can help them with that because we can increase their confidence and we can connect them to folks. So when I showed you this, I'm going to go back, this right here, this retention rate, we were like, what the heck just happened? We're out of the job. So we went and did, a, we did an independent research study, and we looked at what is the greatest predictor of retention, what is the greatest predictor of retention at the University of South Carolina for students who take University 101? What is it? Whether they show up. Whether they show up? That would be nice. Yeah, it is. That's the li that's likelihood of academic success, if they show up. You got it. Sense of belonging. Sense of belonging. Yeah, yeah, right. They're showing up. They're there. They're hanging out. Sense of belonging. For every standard deviation, so on the survey, if a student answered a, f a 5 versus a 4, for every standard deviation, there was a 38% chance that the student was more likely to, re to return to the University of South Carolina. So, for example, if you got a student who gives on a survey, five point scale, they answer a three. A kid who answers a four, there's a 40% chance that they're going to stay, a 40% better chance that they're going to stay at the University of South Carolina. They answer a five, it's an 80% chance that they're going to stay at the University of South Carolina. And the three questions that make that up is that the student felt accepted by students at the university, it's easy for them to make friends, they're able to identify other students with similar interests. And there's no better place in the first year seminar to help our students do this. If you focus on nothing else in your class, make sure your students know each other's names. Make sure that they can talk in that class, they can share their concerns, they can share their challenges, they can sense that, hey, 30% of students don't drink. This is something we know nationally. Show it to them in the classroom, all right? Let those kids that don't drink talk about it. So the other ones are like, oh, thank God, I'm not the only one. You aren't at an SEC school, but at us, that's a big problem. Um, everybody drinks all the time, it seems like. Um, so sense of belonging is uh, what, where we need to focus our efforts. Sense of belonging. And you all can do that. So MapWorks, I'm going to keep going back to this because I just kept thinking about it while she was talking up there. It's, it's, it's freaking great. But you know who's going to make the greatest impact on a student if they've got a problem? You. Ask them about it. How are you doing? How are things going? Do you have one-on-one -on -one conferences with them? Because you should. Do you have them write journals? Because you should. Those kinds of things, when you read it, and then you do something about it. So wait, you, Stephen, you said students don't show up. So if, you do, if they don't show up, do you just let that happen? Do you send a report? Maybe that might be nice. But that report is going to do nothing if you don't say, where were you yesterday, Angie? It, you, you got nothing. All right, so all these things, all these things can work, but you holding a student accountable, talking to them, asking them how they're doing, knowing things aren't going well with their family, know they're struggling with it financially, being able to point them to the financial aid office to let them realize that there's a lot of money out there available to them if they do things right, showing them that there's academic support resources. I require my students as an assignment to go to a supplemental instruction session. They have to go if they want to pass my class. So it forces them to go to something that they probably won't go to because it's optional. Um, and it's going to engage them in something meaningful and valuable. So I'm going to skip through this a little bit. Um, there's some more background to the first year seminar and why it works. Have you all heard about high impact practices? This is what this is. This is something that, they, that, that uh, George Koo and his folks up there in Indiana kind of put together as things that work. And then we know they work because we have data to back it up. But what they're moving towards now, what Jillian Kinsey um, is moving towards now, and um, as they're starting to talk about up there, is that high impact practices, it doesn't just, just because the first year seminar is service learning, that's not the only high impact practice. Anything can be a high impact practice. A student job on campus can be a high impact practice. What it is, it's the things that happen as a part of that experience that makes it a high impact practice. So it's things like having discussions and sharing your ideas, revising a paper, asking questions, um, having somebody that cares about you, um, having a relationship, a positive relationship with somebody on campus. These are the kinds of things, I'll send this around, it's a lot of words. Um, these are the kinds of things that make a big impact. So we can do this in class, and I like the good practice in undergraduate education as a model of sorts is the things we can focus on in the classroom. And we've used a lot of these kind of big words here, um, like active learning and prompt feedback and emphasizing time on task. But basically what this means, we're engaging students meaningfully in our classroom. 
So we're doing fun and active things. So you know, maybe you do a little better job at the game show than I did. Um, um, and then you also get them talking to each other. Um, you're doing a 60, 60, 30, 30 to start the day. Um, you give them back their, their uh, papers and you have them peer review them and give each other feedback on these kinds of things. The more engaging you can make your class, the better. Um, because as we found, this is um, a study of first year seminars across the country. The top predictor of overall course effectiveness is engaging pedagogy. The second is course readings. And you know what? Honest to God, we think it's a negative predictor. It means people are using the course reading so poorly that people are upset about it, and it's negatively impacting the success of the course. It's the assigning a reading and never talking about it kind of thing. Um, so positive predictor, though, is engaging pedagogy. The class is taught in an engaging way. And I'm going to move past that to show you this. Ta-da! When I talked to you about how this whole thing started, I came around and I told you, I'm going to tell you to focus on what's going to make the greatest impact. Greatest impact on retention, sense of belonging. Your students feel like they belong at Northern Illinois University. They want to be at Northern Illinois University. They know you're going to be here for them at Northern Illinois University. That's number one, greatest predictor for retention. Greatest predictor for the successful class are these seven things. These seven things right here. So variety of teaching methods. So that means you're doing something different every day. Anybody ever know the social barometer? Anybody know what a barometer does? Measures pressure? So you do a social one. So you say, that's strongly agree, that's strongly disagree. The students come up here and you ask them a question. Uh, the University of Wisconsin is the greatest school in the state of Wisconsin. Strongly agree, everybody moves over here. right? Um, so you have them move around and then you have a conversation. So why do you stand where you stand? So that's a cool thing. You do it every day, people are going to hate it. All right, but you do it once or twice in the semester, I think that's kind of neat. You know? So you want to mix it up. You do something for about 15 minutes. You don't do what I've been doing for the last hour, which is talking at you. I'm sorry. Tom's mad. Um, but you want to you do things different. So a variety of teaching methods. And that's what your faculty resource manual is going to help you do. That's what you're going to help each other do is, as we figured out before, Stephen knows how to talk about wellness. He's got a great activity. We're all going to do it. Meaningful class discussions. It's asking open-ended questions and giving plenty of time for students to respond. Letting them drive it. Was it you? Who said it? Who said we're going to switch up the class? Was it you? So respond to student needs? Was it you? So we come in, the students are, there's something they want to talk about, so we ditch it? Is that you? See? Genius. That's it. <laughs> the students come in and they're having, they need to talk about registration today. Well, we're talking about it then. That's what they need to do. Challenging assignments, and challenging doesn't mean um, like 20 page research paper, it means that they're mentally engaged in the, in the assignment. So they're doing work, uh, they're doing things that they think are valuable, relevant, interesting, applicable. They know they're going to get feedback on it, they know they're going to get it in a timely manner. Um, those kinds of things are going to be important. Productive use of class time, starting on time, ending on time, and doing something meaningful in between. Um, students, they get to go early, they, they like it in the moment. It's like giving a kid too much candy. They love it. They're so happy. All this candy, and then they feel terrible, and they hate you for it. Um, I don't know if that happens. I don't have kids. Um, but anyway, they like it if you let them go early that day. But over time, they're going to think, like, well, clearly they don't care, so I, why do, I don't have to care. Um, you encourage them to speak in class and to work together. And the last one is meaningful homework. They're doing things that they feel like they're, that, that they're proud of. So they've completed something that they're proud of. Um, and that, that really matters um, to the student experience. So that's, that is a bunch of different types of engaging pedagogies. I will send that to you. All of these things are in your manual. So I, I just want to bring this kind of last quote here. Is that elaborating, discussing, sharing, questioning, and problem solving increases motivation and learning. When students are doing something, when they are doing something in college, and we already knew this, they get involved. We talk about that all the time. They're doing something. But you can do that in the classroom, too. They're doing something in the classroom. They are contributing to the learning that's taking place. And when they're doing that, they feel like they belong. They feel like they're a part of something. They feel like they can make it. And they are going to get themselves here in six years or less, hopefully, um, even though they all think they're done in three and a half or four. But we're going to get them here. And we can do that by starting in the first year seminar with super engaging pedagogy um, that gets students to where they need to be. So I'm out of time. 
officially. I was going to have you talk about it. Um, there's some more excited. There's my contact information. You can contact me at any point, whenever. I love talking about this stuff. But right now, um, if Denise will, you want me to take questions? Yes. Yes. Can I can I answer some questions? Anybody have? First, thanks a lot. <laughs> we make it. Hey. It's kind of small. Um, but you know what? I, had, I teach a spring section for our, at our institution. The spring section is uh, mostly transfer students, almost all of them. Um, but we also, I had, I had two adults in my class over the age of 55 um, who were coming back to college because they didn't complete a degree, degree early, earlier point in their lives and had come to, economic, or had come to financial hardship. And I told them on the first day, I said, you know, I really pitched this class kind of at the 19-year-old thing, because it's where a lot of these kids are at, the kind of 19. And they're like, oh, that's OK. Just make it, make it fun for me. I said, OK. Um, and so I do. And you do the, the same strategies work well for everybody. You all are probably just as bored as I am listening to me talk this whole time. Um, but these engaging strategies, the nice thing about them is that they're they can, they can ramp up. So you ask one question. Let's pretend Steven's an 18-year-old and um, Brian's a 50-year-old. And, right, and so I ask, um, we ask, we do this really fun social barometer activity. What's cool about it is because Steven's 18, he goes over here. But because Brian's uh, 55, he goes over here. And now we're talking about those differences and why they're standing where they're at. And then maybe they both kind of move towards the middle. So I, I haven't faced a lot of challenges because my population is particularly young, but I, I think that the nature of this course can do the same kinds of things. You just have to let people pitch it at their own place. So if you've got an assignment, if it's open up enough for students to be reflective, to apply their own experience, you're going to get a very different paper from your adult student than you're going to get from your 17, 18 year old student, but they're both going to learn at the same level and it's going to be just as valuable for each of them individually because they've got to apply their own level of learning. Does that make any sense? Did I answer your question? You feel insufficient? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Unfortunately, this for the yeah, for me it's most of the students are uh, right out of high school. What else? Okay. Hello. I have a question for you then. Uh, I oh, deal no. with orientation yeah. um, of new students on the advising side. And how do you convince What is the value in this if I don't really need it to grow? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, and uh, th 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 that's it's a good question. And I show them the data. Um, first year students like it too. Um, to be able to say that we know students who take this course do better their first year, they graduate at a higher rate, and they're more likely to stay at our institution, they like to know that. I also like, you know, I also tell them that, hey, um, people report making more friends and lo loving this institution more than folks that don't. We talk about resources and opportunities. So did you know such and such existed? And they go, no. And I go, oh, well, that's cool, because we talk about that in class. Um, I'll let them know that there are 19 students in this class. And for us, that's a very small first year class. You know, if you're taking a first year, any first year class at the University of South Carolina, it's got 300 students in it. So for them, this is an opportunity f to be in a small class to have their voice heard every day. And I tell them those kinds of things. Um, the, the, but the most powerful voice is the peers. So they have an orientation leader tell them, this is the greatest thing I ever did. Um, they have their siblings tell them, it's the greatest thing I ever did. Um, it's talked about amongst students, and that's what encourages them to take it. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's my best advice, is letting them know the benefits of the course and showing them that, but then also talking to them about the things that you know that they want. They want to well, do well academically. They want to make friends. And the first year seminar helps them do that. Yeah. But they don't all listen, yeah. <laughs> Can I ask you that? Please. That we actually have challenge too, but it's one of the greatest obstacles is the parents mm. because of the pain there. So how do we get parents on board supporting that? Because I've literally had students um, say, no, my mom only wants me to take courses that count towards graduation. So I think that's a, a real important obstacle. Mm -hmm. So then how do we engage the parents? How can we engage? 
Well, you know, I think that's a great question, and it comes back to that retention and graduation numbers. Like, can you? Sh I mean, parents have no idea that they have as much of an idea, especially you know, first generation parents that, or the, excuse me, their child is first generation. They have no idea that it's going to take. It's probably going to take more than four years, and that most of these students who start don't finish. And their first, and the classes that they take aren't going to be specific for the major. Correct. Yeah. And that's also an education piece for parents as well. Yeah. So everything seems overwhelming, and everything's really hard. There's a lot of things to learn, and so I think showing them those numbers as well is really important. Is to educating parents as to that. You know, first year students, if they're not doing this kind of stuff, uh, but if they are, look at this: higher grades, most likely to return, more likely to graduate. And and I, I focus on the academic success piece, less about the friends, but uh, more on the academic success. Is they're going to do. They're going to do better here, and it's not because and it, the, it's because of the way we teach the class. My goal in this class is to give them assignments and homework and activities that help them be successful in their other classes, and that's a, probably an important way to explain it to, to parents and students. Is you know I'm going to give you assignments and homework, as um, we often say, University 101 is an easy A, but it is not an effortless A, because we're going to ask you to do work that's going to help you be successful in your other classes. But you do it, you show up, you do the work, you're going to get an A in my class. And I bet you'll get an A in your other classes. So I think, yeah, it's, it's really the messaging and um, showing folks the results. Kevin, if I could add to that. I Please. I look at it as an investment. And the $300 that a family will pay additional for this one-hour course, in my opinion, is well worth the investment when you look at the results of it. So if that, if that helps. Obviously, we're not going to convince everybody, but and there's no guarantees. But I look at it as, as kind of an insurance policy of sorts that um, when you look at the data, the retention and the GPA information, um, to me, as, as a parent of a former college student, I would see that as a, a, a very valuable investment for that student's and I will readily admit, I had a hard time convincing my own daughter to take the first year <laughs> at her campus, but she eventually saw the wisdom of it. Okay. Are there any more burning questions that need to be I'll be around all day. Kevin will be around all day. Thank you. Thank so you, much. guys.